In today's book review, we got the Anunnaki Connection, Sumerian Gods, Alien DNA, and the Fate of Humanity. So I've been looking a lot around history and realizing that all of our history is a lie and covered up, and I wanted to keep searching for the truth, and the truth is within these books. See, so the omission is the most powerful form of a lie, and it is the duty of the historian that lies do not creep into the history books. For the past 200 years, ancient Egyptians have captured our imaginations through Rosetta Stone set in motion, the phenomenon known as Egyptian mania. Then the same with the Sumerians, particularly their Pathian of gods known as the Anunnaki, now everywhere because of the internet. YouTube has 1.2 million search results in the Sumerian and Anunnaki together. The Sumerian knowledge of the cosmos was mind-blowing with accuracy, so much it would later influence advancing civilizations like Egyptians, Greeks, and even our own culture. It's like they were as advanced, if not way more, than we are even today. What is hiding beneath the Anunnaki, giants, extraterrestrials, ancient technology, lost civilizations, and the truth of human origins where we actually come from? The knowledge regarding the Anunnaki and their connection to the human origin is still restricted by an elite control mechanism known as the Great Filter, where people at the top will censor all the actual information and cover everything up and just show people a bunch of lies because they don't know who they really are and where they came from. In the lower levels of the museums around the world, there are thousands of hidden artifacts and that are hidden from the world because they are considered too threatening. And later towards the end of the book, it started explaining how a lot of artifacts, they can somehow be bought by privately individual people who have all the money. But if they have all the tablets in the world and they know exactly what they mean, they have the secrets of the universe and they keep it for themselves, then obviously we don't know anything. If they start burning libraries down, they take away the books, they take away the knowledge, we don't we don't even know and only a select handful of people know the truth. Every possible avenue of knowledge must be explored. Every door tried to see if it will open. Civilization began around the first time an angry person cast a word instead of a rock. 200 million years ago, Earth's supercontinents, Laurasia and North and Gondwana in the South began moving closer to one another. The ice age happened and then the ice fields that covered the polar regions melted causing the sea levels to arise. Before the rise in Sumerian civilization, no known permanent and organized settlements are found in the archeological record. For a group of humans to be considered a civilization rather than a tribe or band, they must have a large urban center, full-time primary producers of food, paying surplus to a deity or ruler, monumental architecture, a ruling class, exempt from manual labor, a system for recording information such as writing, development of exact practical sciences, monumental art, regular importation of raw materials, a class structure, lower, middle, higher, a state religion, a theology, and a persistent state structures. So when we go look at all a lot of the past civilizations like the Sumerians, it's like they had all this stuff so long ago and were never taught any of that stuff anywhere. The discovery of the Sumerians rattled the pre-existing beliefs about the rise of human civilization. Who are these people and why have they been left out of history for 2,000 years? No doubt they were intelligent, creative, and highly complex like modern people. Inventions and technologies the Sumerians were credited for, the invention of time based on increments of 60, mathematics, geometry, the 360 degrees full circle, the wheel, wheeled vehicles, astronomy, weights, measurements, sailboats, maps, wind power, economics, philosophers, wind power, the concept of the end of the work day or school day, labor unions, surgery, dentistry, optometry, pills, credit and financing, lawyers, bankers, clergy, the concept of professional careers, schools, universities, libraries, maps, sailboats, a bicameral Congress having a Senate and a House of Representatives. So they had, like I thought dentistry was like, oh, just now was recently. It's like they've had this stuff forever. And, you know, if 4,000 years later, 8,000 or 10,000 years later, a lot of things, you know, you put a truck in the middle of the forest and 40 years it deteriorates and you don't even know what's there. A lot of stuff that only stays there are stone-like structures made out of like stone, brick, clay tablets. Everything else kind of disappears over time. So at the end of the day, you we really don't know much. These highly intellectual and teachable skills rooted in the more deeper conceptual way of thinking. These early civilizations began with Sumerians and would later include the Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, the incredible leap from hunter-gatherers. The Nippar and Lagath cities 
found cuneiform tablets. When scholars tried to siphon in the tablets, they found numerous words and symbolic values that did not completely fit with the previously understood Semitic grammar and vocabulary. It was not Akkadian language at all, but rather a completely unknown language type. Myths are written, stories on tablets are passed down orally on how to live life and spiritual knowledge, hence humans be best learned through stories. More than so, or more than 50 tablets or stories talking about the Sumerian gods known as the Anunnaki, the gods had a hierarchical system differentiating between the Anunnaki, the great gods, and the Igis, or Igi, the little gods. When studying the Anunnaki, one common laminate is that it is difficult to keep track of who's who. The Greek and the Roman gods, for instance, the Greek goddess of love, Aphrodite, was also known by the Romans as Venus. So names kind of, you know, switch around a lot. The Sumerian holy trinity is An or Anu, Anhil or Elil, and Enki or Ie. An or Anu was the father to Enki and Enlil. The main purposes of the Anunnaki described in the Sumerian myth, Enki and the world order was to decide the fate of humanity. Enlil ruled over Uruk when he ruled over people. Enlil had a wife, a goddess deity named Nihil. Together they formed a royal couple comparable to Zeus and Hera. Enlil was from the beginning the wisest. Some myths even portray him as clumsy or actually brutal. Enki in Ie is often portrayed as the more intelligent and cunning exercise in the technical function of power. He is often called Nandumid, the one whose business is to manufacture and produce. Divine symbols representing apparently various aspects of civilized life con or concreased or concrized, and the aspect of jewelry and talisman would increase the power of a god when granted by another god. Enki had an important sanctuary in Eridu, in the mythical world geographically, and in Elil, resided in the place of heavenly gods, and situated higher than Elil, while Enki, even though he frequently moved to the gods above, had a separate residence called Abuzu, which is characterized as underneath the freshwater tab or table on which floats on the flat disk of earth where humans live. Enki also considered Apukala, the seven sages, very experts from Abzu. Taking the form of fish with any second head having a human face, Enki used the sages as intermediaries to establish culture and bring civilization to men. According to the myth, Apukala were saved from the great flood the same scholars believe that was the original source of the myth for the great flood of the bible so when you see so many different civilizations say the same thing over and over where it's like every single tablet and every single epic talked about the great flood and you realize like oh the stuff kind of has to be true over time or you you uh have to not take it as a myth anymore and when they talked about having things like uh crystals and metals that you wear these are energy things of the gods when you wear them it'll enhance certain aspects depending on how you wear it on your body what day of the week day of the year what time when you do certain things in rituals great things can happen according to stitchin an author and scholar of the anunnaki originally there was a comic egg the concentrated atomic mass that exploded after reaching the theoretical density limit some 15 billion years ago the gravitational forces of our solar system drew in a reddish planet called Nibiru. This planet traveled in our solar system below the elliptical, passing through the orbits of Neptune and Uranus. The intensity of its magnetic field shifted Uranus to its side, allowing Nibiru to pass. At that time, there was no planet Earth, but rather a much larger Tiamat. Tiamat was covered by water in the course of trajectory. One of Nibiru's moons struck Tiamat, dividing it into two parts. It pulverized the half where it struck, creating the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and it pushed the other half into lower orbit. The current path of the Earth during this process, Earth's gravity captured one of Nibiru's moons, taking it as its own satellite. The first passage of Nibiru was responsible for the current configuration of our solar system. Pluto was a moon of Saturn that was torn from its gravity and pushed into the present orbit. Nibiru had an elliptical period of 3,600 years and moves around two suns. The Sumerians described Nibiru as four times larger than Earth and responsible for the great catastrophes on our planet during its passage through the solar system. The approach of this planet was the cause of the deluge in both the Mesopotamia myths and the Bible due to polar displacement on Earth when the North and South Poles switch and it causes you know, big problems, and that happens because of Nibiru. 
Nibiru is the home planet of people described in the ancients as the race of the gods or Anunnaki. These gods visited Earth in the past, influencing human culture. Anunnaki means descended from the heavens, also known to the Hebrews as Nephilim or Elium, and the ancient Egypt as Neter. These alien gods landed in the ancient Mesopotamia about 450,000 years ago and colonized the Earth for the purpose of extracting large quantities of gold from the Earth. Anu, Enki, and Enlil descended from the southern Mesopotamia where they established Eridu, which means home away from home. So basically, Earth is this plane, right? And above it, in the stars and the planets, that's where heaven's at. And then below is where hell is at. And you can reach those different states when you're on Earth, but those gods that would rule certain planets had certain energies that would affect human beings on Earth, depending on where they're at in the sky, and different things rule at different times. So... That is kind of that, but those Anunnaki people, they had their own planet, they needed gold, and I feel like every single person lost and is attracted over gold. I certainly am, and it's like you see it, and it's exactly it rules with the planet. I want to say like Jupiter and the sun, but what does the sun look like? The sun is golden, just like gold, and that's what gold does here on Earth. The Anunnaki began construction of the establishments necessary for mining and colonization, needing resources like food and water. They created Eden, a field of agriculture and farming. They soon discovered gold deposits in South Africa. Satisfied, Anu left command of the mission to Enlil, while Enki directed the gold mines in present-day Zimbabwe. But the company Anunnaki were used for hard labor, soon refused to work, which is similar to the biblical account of the rebellion against the Olahim. During the time, groups of Homo erectus lived in southern Africa, observing that Enki realized that these primates were suitable for the mining operation. He captured a female and brought her to Enlil. The Anunnaki genetically manipulated an egg of this female, grafting it to Enki's wife, Nihurasag's DNA. Thus, about 2,000 years ago, a sterile male, physically strong and intelligent hybrid was born. The Anunnaki called it Lulu and cloned many more. These Lulu were created with the sole purpose of obeying and working. Excited and amused by this experiment, Enlil ordered his Anaki or Anunnaki scientists to create new beings by mixing Lulu's DNA with that of other animals on Earth, creating a hard or herd of Chimera. The creation of the Chimera explains the abundance of anthropomorphic primitive gods as well as the half human, half animal versions because they kept manipulating and crossbreeding different things. So Enki decided that Lulu needed the ability to procreate and Lil disagreed on this point, fearing uncontrollable growth of the beings capable of rebellion and potentially harming the Anunnaki mission. Enki retorted that with the limited number of Lulu available, the mission will surely fail then against his will and Lil ended up approving the fertilization of Lulu into the generation of early man or Adama, origin name of Adam. The idea that Adam could be dangerous due to the retained hunter-gatherer tributes and behaviors divided the Anunnaki. Unfortunately for the Adam, when Enlil learned about the humans and Anunnaki had been engaging in sexual intercourse and even procreating, he was enraged. He accused the human female's origin of sin in an effort to prevent the problem from reaching a redo. He gave orders to drive human beings out of Eden. In the Bible, this is the explosion from the earthly paradise. So that was a lot to take in. And humans, I always saw it's like, dude, why is everyone a slave? Everyone's kind of depressed. We all don't like our lives. Why are we doing, why are we working jobs that have no meaning? It's like, if everyone stopped their pointless jobs of accounting, doing things with taxes and numbers and computers, if we all just simply lived together and helped each other, we all had our own gardens, we could all help each other out. We wouldn't need to deal with all the 99% BS that we don't like and after seeing that, I wanted to realize, like, why are we in this mindset? Why are the, Who are these things controlling all these different things, making us all slaves, giving us bad food, poisoning our air, water, the air we breathe in, the food we eat, the water we drink? It's, like, so messed up. So I'm going to find the root of that, and it's now kind of coming out of this. So, meanwhile, in Africa, Enki began passing on knowledge to certain humans to establish the first kings. Enki bestowed the title of the priest on the first ruler and established the original mystery school. He was complete in total obedience or the face of punishment of death. This concept of absolute power was adopted by the kings who went on to exploit their subjugated workers and use violence to exploit them. Slaves were harvested among primitive humans and genetically manipulated. So basically the gods manipulated human into making them their slaves and doing whatever they wanted. And sometimes they would revolt and it's like, why, why? 
it's kind of messed up, right? Just to be born a slave, it's kind of really, really messed up. I don't like that at all. So then the alien colonization system began to decline because of our low productivity and the rebellion of human slaves, especially in the mines. The lineages of kings were established and recorded on what we know on the Sumerian kings list, possibly considered the direct progeny of the Anunnaki themselves. These kings were the first mystery school initiatives versed in the sciences such as mathematics, astronomy, knowledge, medicine, architecture, and engineering. So they gave us a lot of wisdom and different things to, you know, Nowadays, you know, so we have all these different technologies that might not even be ours, but you know, we have architecture. We're, we're pretty decent in civilization for the most part. I feel like for the most part, we get along rather than not. And if you all saw things from other people's point of views, we'd all realize that like, you know, we, we do have like good lives for the most part. And the alien colonization system began to decline because of low productivity, the rebellion of human slaves. A hundred thousand years ago, Anu died and Enlil inherited the position of the gods and decided to go back to Nibiru. Enki and Enlil's half-brother and son of concubine knew that he would not be able to ascend to the throne, so he refused to leave, feeling that he already had his own dominion on earth. Enlil got angry and departed. Enki did not know what to do with all the abandoned gold, so he began to give it to the gifts of the most important faithful of men. Then about 50,000 years ago, Enki left Africa and headed to Eridu. Accompanied by the loyal kings, priests, and initiatives, their people constituting the first major migration from Africa to the Middle East, eventually a revolt broke out on Nibiru and Enlil was exiled by his own royal family. Enki was then urgently recalled to Nibiru as heir to the throne with the Anunnaki abandoning Earth about 5,000 years ago. So another thing is the kings and the priests and the higher up people that knew a lot of knowledge, I want to say a lot of them, they were crossbred with the Anunnaki directly. So that's where the royal family comes into play. And that's why you have the kings and queens of all the, I guess, ancient Egypt, Sumerians, Babylonians. And then nowadays we have the royal family in what, like the UK around there in Europe. And they're, they, all the people that rule the world, they're from the royal bloodlines, which they probably crossbred with actual Anunnaki themselves and they don't like to mix with other human beings. They like to stay completely the same bloodline. But that's where you get, you know, the kings from and they got passed on all the knowledge how to rule certain places and enslave humanity and such. Accompanied by blah, 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 blah. Pasperemia, theory of primitive life originating from another planetary body, was deposited on Earth by a way of a comet, asteroid, or other type of space debris. Egyptian texts had the hypothesis that the story of Exodus was not fiction, but rather a real event of celestial nature. 4,000 years ago, there was an explosion on Jupiter resulting in a planet-sized fragment separating from what we now call Venus. This comet rushed toward the sun and entered an elliptic orbit crossing the Earth. Around 1500 BC, entered the comet's tail. At first, the atmosphere was filled with fine red dust that fell to the surface of the planet, painting the ground and polluting the water. When the Earth came closer to the head of the comet, large particles fell, hurling the Earth's a fierce meteor shower, even hail, which undoubtedly caused great destruction. A huge amount of hydrocarbon was released into the atmosphere in the form of rains, some of which reached the ground and leached into the depths, forming modern oil reserves. However, the oil falling from the sky was ignited by lightning, so it appeared as though it fell from the sky. This was the reason that Venus played a role in a huge number of myths, legends, and ancient astronomical historical texts the Persians account a day that lasted three days and a night that which lasted three nights. The Chinese wrote about a time when the whole earth was burning and the sun didn't set for a certain amount of time. But imagine like, you know, nowadays we have all this crazy technology like helicopters and planes and we have these guns and these atomic weapons and stuff. Imagine if we were all hibernating on one part of the earth and let other things just live out for 4,000 years without any technology or knowledge. We come to them. We have all these flying things. We're going to seem like gods to those people. So... It really gets crazy when you start thinking about things. Getting triple up over the smaller matters keeps us from looking at the bigger picture and this is what we miss, the truth. The truth is a bigger, more complex image to visible to all if we could just look at our own limited views and come together to what is hidden in plain sight. Of course, there are many people who make a living now pushing a one-sided view of reality. So it is in their interest to keep up the walls, divide and conquer has always been the effective strategy, unfortunately. Money is kind of the root to all evil. I really wish money didn't exist and we all just helped each other out and did things out of the kindness of our heart. The Babylonian creation epic, the Anu Alis, 
Tiamat and Nibiru, the history of our solar system is told in the Enumu Elis. Similar to Genesis, it consists of seven tablets corresponding to the seven days of creation from Genesis. And just like the seventh day rest in Genesis, the seventh tablet is dedicated to the glorification of the Babylonian creator deity. The gods discuss creation of the man in both. In the Enimu Elix, the planets are referred to as the gods which are involved in an epic battle. At the time the Earth did not exist, there was a planet named Tiamat between Mars and Jupiter about the size of Uranus. A strange planet called Nibiru came from the outside solar system. Nibiru was caught in the gravity of our solar system and caused, among the other things, the tilting of Uranus and Pluto became a separate planet. Nibiru also exerted its gravity on the various planets in our solar systems. One of the moons of Nibiru collided with Tiamat, and later Nibiru collided with Tiamat. The fragments of Tiamat formed the asteroid belt and possibly various comets and loose asteroids, and the remainder was hurled into orbit around the sun and became the planet Earth, while another moon, Tiamat, became our current moon, this. So it's really cool to see how <laughs> everything was kind of formed, and these are all in clay tablets from a history. Obviously, it's hard because you have to decipher it, and there's someone that can translate these things, but it's cool how, seeing how everything became about. Nibiru orbits the sun every 3,600 years due to the clashes of Nibiru. Nibiru is referred to as the elixir of life or the seed of life. Nibiru, the 12th planet, when one excludes the sun and the moon, is the 10th planet. Description or designation for a planet, star, moon, or celestial body, which is divine qualities were granted. The truth is the further back you go in history, the less you can know for sure. Physical evidence can be degraded. Languages can disappear along with text and nature reclaims. Her domination from humankind this is how civilizations become lost and you remember hearing things about oh atlantis and things that are just lost fossil records only go back 2.6 million years anymore and we cannot detect it as it would already turn to dust the only thing that mostly stays the same is gold the ancient world still holds more secrets than we do to believe this seems to be a universal connection underpinning everything from the pyramids of giza stonehenge ancient cultures from all parts of the world that share similar origin stories. The deities and beliefs through these supposedly never had contact with one another. What is this connection? The energies that come from the farthest planets and stars do not differ from those energies that compromise humankind. It is in this sense, man himself is a small celestial body like a planet or a star. We shine with our own light and sometimes reflect the light of others almost like an avatar. The most important thing to understand that is that in this world turns into a single network through which an infinite amount of energy circulates. The small connects us to the large and the large connects us to the small. What is above is below. What is below is like above. Historically, those who understand this ancient principle have grasped the essence of the cosmic laws, have been able to establish contact with celestial forces through the base materials on earth, such as stones, metals, plants, which are inherently connected to the energy of the celestial bodies above. Just like I was saying before, each planet rules a certain gemstone, a certain metal, and a certain crystal, a certain plant, a certain tree, as above is so below. So you have to study that and realize it. You can gain the energy and the power of said planet when you wear the certain metals, crystals, have the plants around you. Like this, this planet over here is made for me in astrology. Despite the demigods' supposed power, their actions are far from ideal and bear out to the baseness and the earthly character of biological animals. But they weren't all evil and they weren't stories of the gods helping humanity. So eventually I, or it'll talk about how one of the Anunnaki's kind of rebelled and wanted to help humanity. And it's always amazing to see some good person trying to help us out. The physically, physicality of the Anunnaki had wide eyes, sharp features, intrinsically styled hair and beards. Conspiracy theorists portray them as shape-shifting lizards. Where do you get that from? All the conspiracy theories on Earth. Fishmen, one example might be in Mesopotamia. Fishmen called Oanus, one who part of the group of the demigods called Abgal in Sumerian or Abkalu in Akkadian. According to the legend, these fish-human hybrids were wise gods or sages that came to teach humans the fundamentals of civilization. These people emerged from the water taking human form during the day among people and then disappear in the night so that's where you get the shape-shifting different animals and realize that like oh humans i think we can do all of these things we can transfer metals to different metals energy can't be transferred or destroyed or energy can't be created or destroyed only transferred so it's like we can you know shape shift into any animal any being anything potentially you just got to learn how to do it and 
you know, we're all enslaved to this thing, how we're limited beings and we can't do this, can't do that because of all the chemicals that are in our body that distort our real reality of, you know, what's real and what's not. Giants, one of the more popular claims of the Anunnaki were giants. The Bible references of the Nephilim as the giant offspring of the sons of the gods who mated with the human females. The ancient Greeks had titans, true, bless, another strangely common theme for deities, and one of the most distinctive features of the gods of India is blue skin. Blue skin people have been found in Egypt and even the South American. Some researchers claim the Anunnaki skin was blue, the blood of the gods may have been blue, noble origin. So you know how like we for the most part, if you bleed, or you run and do different things, your body kind of turns red, your face blushes, the blood rushes to the skin. These blue people might have just had blue blood inside of them, which is kind of funny because like, you know, the Simpsons are like yellow and then you got those Smurfs, the ones that are blue. True blue, another strangely common deity for deities, blah, blah, blah. The engineers, as soon as their beings were set foot in Mesopotamia, construction began. Cities grew like weeds. The temples and buildings aligned with the stars and planets. And that's where he gets like, dude, these, they were way more smarter than us if they can move these blocks from different places of the earth, have them in perfect geological locations that line up directly to stars and different things with mathematics being literally on the dots at the thousandth of an inch. It's like they were more advanced than we could ever even imagine. Again, we're just covered up in history about like, oh, we don't know how blank happened when it's all hidden. The engineers, as soon as there began, as set forward in Mesopotamia, blah, 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 the Sumerians believed that the gods to whom the temple was delegated to actually lived in it. The god defended the city from all threats and troubles, and the city pledged to worship a god. A specific ritual was intended for each deity, with the mysteries, the chants, and collective worship and obligatory sacrifices according to the Sumerian understandings, and the natural order of humans existed only to serve the deities. The Anunnaki diet, the components of the divine diet and eating habits of Mesopotamian gods and goddesses, were preserved in the Sumerian text. Their nourishment was important not to only the survival of the gods, but also their appeasement. Initially, the gods were vegetarian and possibly vegan. They only began to eat meat after the creation of humankind. They used their human slaves to produce food, hence the development of agriculture. The lands of the Sumerians provided a bounty of food. The grew millet, wheat, rice, rye, made different types of bread. They grew many fruits and vegetables, including apples, apricots, beets, cabbages, cherries, chickpeas, figs, grapes, lentils, lettuce, melons, mulled berries, onions, pears, plums, pomegranates, radishes, and turnips. Meat was also eaten, but primarily offered to the gods and royalty. Sources including beef, chicken, ducks, fish, geese, goats, sheep, turtles. Oh no, the turtles, save the turtles. <laughs> Some gods even ate human flesh. Text suggested that this was rare. One case, a person who had been the victim of black magic caught the gods commanding to devour the enemy. The gods had the sweet tooth that would sweeten their foods with grape and date syrup, as well as honey. There were among their favorite offerings were especially cakes. Goddesses and gods loved to drink different type of alcoholic beverages. Interestingly, leeks, onions, garlics, and fish were banned from the meals before any worship or their ritual activities because the Anunnaki did not like how it was made the human breath smell. It is widely known to the Queen Elizabeth that ruled her in a royal family cannot have onions, fish, pungent flavors, especially garlic. And when I was reading a lot of the Vedic texts, it talked about having a diet of just not eating any meat because it is negative energy or causing suffering to other beings, which I agree in and do like. But when they say things like don't eat onion and don't eat garlic, it's like, if it comes from the earth and it's like a herb, why would I not eat blank? But now like it's coming full circle now. According to the fragment of the Aninas descent to the netherworld, demons did not eat. The shining ones, the Anunnaki have been connected to the Ahum of the Bible. The world, the word Elohim has been translated by some alternative researchers to mean bright or shining ones. The shining ones were purportedly beings from advanced civilizations who came to give humanity agriculture and various technologies. Many ancient texts from around the world referring to the gods as somehow illuminated and often directly associated with light. This is frequently the case with the religions worshiping the sun. A common feature of sun worshiping groups is to revere earthly materials reminiscent of the sun or having light reflecting capabilities. This is why you see gold and other bright metals so highly valued. Highly advanced beings wearing metal not only wore metal adornments, they dusted themselves in gold because gold, again, you're all attractive. You can feel it. You can see it. It's just amazing. Mithyl or mythi 
archetypes seen in all cultures, universal story like Jesus or Moses, modern entertainment and Harry Potter, Luke Skywalker, why these figures differ in detail like appearance, culture, time, environment, etc. All the heart, they are the same archetype. Similarly, the Anunnaki also differs in appearance. They change and develop from Sumerian myths to Akkadian or Babylonian. Eventually, Egypt and Olympus, they have to have or they had a thousand faces. So meteors, climate disasters, likely a group of highly advanced beings displaced and bring never before seen technology to hunter gatherers and groups and sent their brightest minds to distant parts of the world. People saw the Anunnaki as the shining gods because of their metallic adornments and their ability to seemingly control nature through agriculture methods like irrigation and artificial pollination. These powers over the primitive people had an effect on certain members of advanced civilization, leading them to the dehumanization, those they referred to as the black-headed people and Adam, the red people. They would eventually enslave some of those locals using controlling techniques, including religion and superstition. They forced these individuals to worship or work for them in physically laborious roles in agriculture and construction. Making sure to keep the majority ignorant as knowledge is indeed power, they allowed a select few of the local tribal leaders to learn writing and other skills that, so that they could act as interpreters and middlemen. They became the priest class, the labor of the newly organized and unified masses under the direction of technocratic elite create an economic boom that has not previously been seen. This could explain the rapid advancements in the region. Good ideas are only there if there are enough people to put them into action. This handful of sages would go to ignite the locals, creating an engine of civilization fueled by cheap labor. It was progress at the expense of justice. However, dissenting members of this group objected to this unfair treatment of the locals and benevolent, eventually defined their own to teach local tribes the great arts and sciences and high cultures such as the agricultural mathematics, astronomy, medicine, and writing. This is often expressed as the work of one's individual known as ubiquitously in global mythology as the bringer of fire and knowledge. Enki to the Sumerians, Prometheus to the Greeks, Matarsivan to the Vedics, and so on. After bestowing the forbidden knowledge, the rebel gods started to assimilate and absorb into the local culture through intermarrying. This interbreeding was frowned upon by the gods who wanted to preserve the royal blood through only breeding with each other, and this led to the practice of sibling marriage as seen in ancient Egypt. So that's kind of wild how they interbreed with their families, because we're told like that's incest, that's weird, it's kind of gross. And it's all, you know, weird. But the fact that some of the gods would teach the gods of the knowledge, not only to like, just tell the people how to do all these different things. They taught some people how to then teach it to the other humans. But then you're going to have some people that are rogue that are good. Just like out in the government, there's whistleblowers and people that are on the good side of humanity helping us out here in these streets. And then they can help other people escape and tell them what to do, which is, again, another awesome thing to see. Three primary sources of the Anunnaki, the Sumerian tablets from the Library of Nepal, the biblical book of Genesis, where they are known as the Elihim, and the Arabic books of Anak, where they were known as angels. A myth is a truer than history, for a history only gives a story of the shadows, where a myth gives a story of the substances that cast the shadows. So we learn the best through myths and stories because... You know, you're able to remember stories so much better because it's fun, it's interesting, and it gives a great example. Just like the golden geese or the rabbit and the turtle. It's like the rabbit and the turtle, you know. The one person, slow and consistent, persistent wins over time versus the person who goes out. The golden goose gives you the golden eggs. Never cut the hand that feeds you. So a myth is far blah, blah, blah. The Garden of Eden for these of one traced back to 3000 BCE on Sumerian clay tablets. Genesis 8-2, and the Lord of the God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put a man who he had formed. An important consideration in this text, it is that Eden existed before man and the garden planted in Eden. Not the creation of humans, but the more advanced through genetically gene manipulating from the gods, aka the Anunnaki. The narrative of the Garden of Eden story is the formation of man with infant or with formation is in civilizing. We are looking at when the naked man of the wilderness was brought inside of the walls of the first city Eden by the Anunnaki that gave them all these different things on how to live. Genesis 2, 5, we see that the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it an uncultivating plain. 
Eve is created from Adam's rib. Wisdom was the result of Adam and Eve eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. By understanding the duality of life through consuming the fruit, Adam and Eve were led to wisdom. Myth is not a literal account for the historical events, but rather a consistently renewed narrative of archetypes and events from the collective that allow humans to fully experience their own consciousness. Now, if you think about it, if you're a god and you're only one person or one thing, you know, you're going to get bored after a while and you're going to come back to earth, even if it's suffering and pain, that things equal growth. But once you ever see the duality of good, evil, hot, cold, low, high, you know, it's actually kind of fun. I'd rather have this experience where like I'm a slave. I have to figure out all these crazy things and the world's so complicated, but that suffering is what makes life so much more enjoyable. If you lived a life that was easy, it'd probably be boring over time. And God wants to play the game of, oh, I want to create all these different things, make them separate, have their own ego. And then eventually they find out that they are everyone else, which is, again, pretty amazing. So death in the Genesis account may be the realization of the concept of death itself. In the garden, man grasped his own mortality and named this concept. It was the realization that man would perish as well as the subsequent naming that made it so. Before eating the forbidden fruit, and man was in a state of blissful ignorance like an animal. After he was cursed with the foreknowledge that he and all whom he loved would eventually die, he could look back and remember his previous state of innocence. He realized the three states of him, past state, current state, and the future state. The Trinity shows up again and again in the mythology of the ancient civilization. Like a big thing that woke me up to all this stuff is psychedelics. And then once I did that, I was able to see through it. But then I realized, like, yo, before I was living in ignorance, fix all those things. But now it's like, all I do is see ignorance everywhere in it. You know, there's always a duality of literally everything to where you can never really mess up. Knowledge of good and evil as the knowledge of inequality. So even if you get rid of a lot of the bad, then you start to see it everywhere else. When if you lived in ignorance, you still had those pleasures. Like, so let's say some people, you smoke a cig. I have nothing against it at all. I used to be judgmental and stuff, and all. it's like, bro, life's a joke. It doesn't matter. But those simple pleasures of like, Mr. Fireball over here, uh, smoking a cig, eating a certain food those people might not feel good after, but they're gonna have the pleasure of the moment. So no matter where you go in life and what you have, you're gonna win no matter what for the most part. So secrecy of a part of most religious seeds, spiritual communities, or even other groups and societies to receive the secrets, many religions demand initiation, rituals, and additional mystical experiences from their own followers. In the ancient societies, secret knowledge was an important strategy for securing power, status, or sometimes simply survival. Even the knowledge of writing was considered privileged information for some, and select groups called mystery cults attached particular importance to the ignition, even constructing their social structures. Around different degrees of initiation, the elites doing messed up things, so they were all sworn into secrecy into a bondage that cannot be broke. These levels of initiating created a distinction of the ranks between the adepts and the masters of the priests. So this is where you see all the elites together, like they, they usually do all these satanic rituals and things because that's how they get initiated and then they get the knowledge of the power and they can't screw each other over because then they would all, you know, everyone realize the truth that they, they do these messed up things like they're pedophiles, they kill kids, they do all these bad things. They can't round each other because they did it themselves and there's already proof and they would go to jail as well. The knowledge filter began with the Sumerians while using terms like new world order and global elites have a place using them to explain the knowledge filter would be a mistake. It reinforces the idea that modern powers preclude knowledge from reaching the public when in fact the knowledge filter began with the Sumerians. The secret knowledge from the gods going so far to claim that they were the heirs of the antediluvian sages who were associated with the Enki, secrets of magic, healing, celestial divinations were hidden from the outsiders by restricting access to the clay tablets. So the sages had all the wisdom, everything, and that's what they would give to everyone else. They had ta that on tablets, and now you see the museums, the governments, and the people who are the richest people on earth, they hide the tablets from everyone, burn all the other knowledge of books so they don't know what even exists. With the direct line to the blah, 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 the, those people are the direct line to the sages, and they should be the gatekeepers of the knowledge. Holding on to this position that made them valuable, not only to the public, but also to the royalty as the conduit of other worldly knowledge. These knowledge bearers had the car of the king. They were head in hand in the king's decisions, a role that has not been long since known for the evidence and the archaeological 
record from the king's list, letters, and official text. Historically, the ruling class dominated by using opulent and excessive material commodities to create visible signs of wealth and social distinction. These elites through history have ruled by theater. The elite used pomp and theater to dazzle the masses. They live on displays and try to maintain and exploit the inequality of their social conditions. That's why you have sports, you have movies, you have TV shows, you have video games. Everyone lives on this entertainment and they all keep slaving away at the same game and they can never think for themselves because they're poisoned by the food they eat, the water they drink, the air they breathe in. You know, you don't even know if there's other beings out there that are robots that just have this negative energy that they've put on you. They can play with the frequencies, like all the things you can't see, the Wi-Fi, the cellular data, just to make you in a state of fear and all these bad things and make you not realize you're everyone else. And you can send you out of fear to continue the cyclist loop and you distract yourself with all the pleasures and all the distractions of life, which, this book, you killing it, bro. You see everything on point. The secret knowledge was another display of power becoming a symbolic or symbolic asset for its gatekeepers. Sumerian education was a sophisticated system learning word not to be able to write correctly, but also memorize them and translate them from Sumerian to Akkadian and back. A graduate of the school had to have a good command of the language of secrets of Enki. So literally they had to learn a language. Imagine if you were in elementary to learn a language, you had to learn how to write down every word correctly in one language and then to another and then back, which is, that's pretty amazing stuff. The practice of magic and exorcism, the Sumerians believed specific demons cause specific diseases. If they could identify which demons cause specific diseases, they could identify which demon by examining a patient and knowing the symptoms. The priest and the prescribed the right treatment, the Sumerian exorcists were actually a trained physician and even held to ethical and legal standards similar to physicians today. There were two types of learners. Only 10% of the first tiers made it to the second tiers and the second tiers had access to learn about the hidden knowledge. An example would be the secret of the great gods. An expert may shower another expert. A non-expert may not able to see it. A restriction of the great gods, the motivation for the select students to pursue higher education, ways to learn and treasure the secrets of Enki. This treasured secret is the lost knowledge from before the flood that was saved by the eunaptism the forerunner to Noah in the flood story. So basically they had to have all these crazy techniques and they take the smartest of smart people, just how I guess the CIA or top government agencies will take the smartest scientists to then make different weapons of mass destruction, bad things, but they take the smartest people and they'd give those people the secrets. And the Epic of Gilgamesh indicates that Gilgamesh attained the great knowledge from a time before the flood and then brought it to its people. He learned absolutely everything for pertaining to wisdom. He saw what was secret, open what was hidden. He brought back a message from before the flood. The text points to the secret knowledge of Enki is the knowledge of a civilization before the flood, as well as the known knowledge of medicinal plants in the Epic of Gilgamesh visits Eunapatism and brings back the secret antediluvian knowledge to civilization. Even Gilgamesh as powerful kings did not have already access to this knowledge. He needed to go to the Unap Ishtam, who had the direct line of communication with Enki in order to obtain those secrets. In both the Epic of Gilgamesh and the King James Version of the Bible, there were redactions, redactions which means they left out parts of the sacred and secret wisdom. And it's like, you just keep searching, you usually follow the money, you follow the truth, but the fact that so many things are always left out is a little bit annoying. Redacted paragraph from tablet XI 196-197 that gives the first indication of something more. I did not dis di disclose the secret of the gods. I showed Atrahes, the Eunaptishtum slash Noah flood hero figure, a dream and thus he heard the secret of the gods. The secret knowledge of Enki is the knowledge of civilization before the great flood. It links Gilgamesh and it turns the kingship into this knowledge. Yunapishtam gave Gilgamesh the knowledge and he was not the only survivor of the flood. There were others that carried the secrets of the anti-Diluvian civilization. I made the animals of the steppe, the creatures of the steppe, and the members, the lit, the sons of the Umanu, the board, the boat. The Yunapishtam saved Umanu, translators to chief scholar. These Anu... Amu Manu were an elite group of scribes from before the flood who survived the Yudnapshtum and their animals were they resettled and shared the secrets of Enki to the kings and the elites of Mesopotamia. In fact, it was Enki who defied the Anunnaki and the gods and warned the Yudnapshtum about the impending flood. So more people were able to save and those people were able to share secrets to the other people. These texts appear to indicate in the Garden of Eden is really the name of the world's first agricultural sediment. 
Rather than a place where a single God created humans from dust and he ribbed 6,000 years ago, it also seemed that the Anunnaki were real flesh and blood beings who ate, made love, fought, and sometimes drank too much. Further statues depicting the gods had blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> God, I mean, blue, blue eyes, often picked out with lapis lazuli. The genetic mutation was probably an old-fashioned selective opposing breeding between the humans and the Anunnaki. Modern astronomy is traced back to 6000 BCE. Sumer and Sumerian astronomy was observations and mathematical. They associated the planets and the stars with the gods and believed the study of the celestial bodies and made it possible to predict the will of these gods. The most important celestial bodies were the Sun, the Moon, and Venus. Sumerian priests carefully tracked planetary movements across the sky, the night sky, in order to calculate the time of harvest, the length of the year, and even to predict various events. They had the temples, observatories that gave the equinoxes and the solstices and wrote these things down on clay tablets. So many things in your life, unfortunately, you have free will to a certain extent, but I think it's very small. Because, you know, life is just crazy. But a lot of the events, they ha you can see them happening because the planets and the stars, they all have an influence on here. And that stuff was already, already going to happen above but when you're able to look and see things before they happen because you can see the future and the stars and what the, the meaning of the stars, the planets, and they have certain transits when they hit, so things will happen under your life down below. But when you're able to see before, it's like you're able to prep yourself and you're able to bring, you know, some amazing instruments to your thing. It's like, you know, if you know there's going to be a war, you may as well stack up on food, guns, and different things to help yourself. The ancients were using the velocity versus time graph to track the motions of the planets. 450 tablets from Babylonian and Uruk dating between 400 and 500 BCE. The Babylonian mathematical astronomy, about 340 tablets, which are tables with computed planetary or lunar data arranged in rows and columns. The Babylonian astronomers were employing sophisticated geometry, computational techniques to determine certain planetary positions. These newly discovered methods clearly foreshadowed the development of calculus. So Matt, like I didn't even know they had all these things because they were on tablets and they were hidden from, I guess, the regular population. The ancients were using a blah, 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 blah. Between worlds, a gateway between one reality and another Iris, the doorway through which the shaman beings, his or her static quest along the world tree, access Mundi from the physical or spiritual plane. It is a divine tunnel located in the sky, which the soul achieves transcendence. Next to the left foot of Orion is the swirling source of a great side reel stream named Iridanus, the river of the judge, Egyptian god Osiris, the judge of the underworld the first home was apparently among the stars a text called the sumerian kings list states after the kingship was descended from the heaven the kingship was in iridu this was basically the spot where the gods called to anunnaki descended from the heaven of the earth the first king named Elium, supposedly ruled for 28,800 years iridu was the planet that ruled earth and water the god enki N means Lord and Ki means Earth. Enki was also known by three names, Lord of Sweet Waters in the Earth, Fresh Water, Lord of the Deep Water, Salt Water, and Lord of the Abyss, Netherworld. His primary symbols included the goat and the fish, which were combined in the zodiac constellation of Capricornus. Eratus, Eratinus, and Capric are the water relation to, related to the constellations. On Earth, the Great Pyramids and the ruins of the cities of Eridu are located approximately in the same latitude, in fact, less than one degree, 88 miles apart, although Giza is necessarily 900 miles from the Earth. However, the sky view is similar. Anku is the god that binds the foes and Osiris, the god of the underworld, and heavenly Ka gateway and Anka being the sky portal. The solar bird, the phoenix, the ziz, was a very large bird of prey whose wingspan was said to be so big it could block the sun. Bible mentions ziz in the Psalms 5011, stating, I know all the birds of the mountains and the ziz, sade is mine. And Ankh, the phoenix pulled the chariots. The bird carries the heat and the fire deriving from the sun. It is a destructive force as well as giving new life and rebirth. The author says, it could seem that what the ancient texts were describing is a connection between the comet and a great bird. February 15th, shout out my birthday, 2013, a 66 foot asteroid with a speed of 40,000 miles per hour fell into the earth. Cherubimnesnik meteor is what it was called. The meteor breaks a port in the atmosphere, so it wasn't a single impact side. I remember this happening in school. 
it was like all over the news and stuff and social media. And it was like this comet fell from whatever in like Russia, I want to say around and started and broke all the windows because of the, the sound of vibration of it. The Egyptian temple of Horus contained references to bird-like figures. The god Horus himself was de often depicted as the falcon or the man with the head of a falcon. The seven sages of ancient Egypt were connected to Toth, to the god wisdom of the beings and creators, the disminded high culture such as the architecture of sacred places. The sages could only pass on knowledge to the initiatives and could not invent something wholly originally or new. The Watchers, a number of constellations referred to as the Watchers because these constellations appear to be looking down on the earthbound spectator from above. In the element of the spiritual travel, the constellations can be seen and as star Mars. Many ancient sites from all of the world built aligned to them. Some of these sites were used as temples and ritual purposes that we may not fully understand. Stonehenge, for instance, was a part of this ancient human knowledge system of the stars serving as a template to help orient us to the cosmos. The thought, and that we were all wondering, like, yo, what are all these things? And it's like, nowadays, we understand all the temples and things. They all have to do with astronomy and pointing to certain things. Thoth knowledge, deity in Egypt who understood all the mysteries that is concealed beneath the celestial vault, traditional knowledge that he recorded, his knowledge and the secret books hidden in different places on earth, and the hope that they would be sought after by future generations, but only those worthy of sacred knowledge would find them. Not trying to brag or anything, but uh, I think that would be me. And use their discoveries to benefit humankind. I do everything for other people because, you know, living a selfless life is the only life to live because you are everyone else, but you do someone else you are doing to yourself. Kingship was handed down directly to the gods. If the human king moved to another city, his kingship would be transferred from one city to another, which gave the perception of intrinsic authority. No one would necessarily question this authority. This divided people making the original 99% against the 1% through the generations, this closed group that carefully guarded their lineage, developed their own parallel set of cultural symbols and practices. These symbols can be traced to the Sumerians, the ruling elites today. The astronomical alignments of Leo, Taurus, and Cirrus were important to the Sumerians, particularly the elites. The desire to unify the world under a totalitarian regime has been bubbling under the surface like an oil seat throughout all of history since the days of the Sumerian kings. Too often we do all think of weapons in purely physical form, but the weapons of culture are often the most dangerous. By confining the, the, masters, or the masses to a narrowly defined set of parameters, those interested in maintaining complete control can easily do so. However, barriers that limit our own expression of free will are weapons of control. So when you mess with someone's mind, that's how you control everything. It's not just the physical form, even though that could put people in a state of fear, like, oh, an asteroid's gonna hit the earth, or oh, we have atomic bombs that we're gonna use against you, or they have fake terrorism happening. Whoever possesses the tablets of destiny would have the divine right of kings. This would allow them to be the ruler of the universe and be granted the power of all past, present, and future knowledge. Where higher dimensions, there could be shadow galaxies, shadow stars, and even shadow people. Where do the people like Nikola Tesla or Sir Isaac Newton get their insights and ideas from? The quantum field where all information resides, they can be awakened through symbols. Value, so symbols, vibrations, sounds, valued messages from dreams and trances and even psychedelics. We can find answers in the Silicon Valley where an in increasing number of psycholetes are discovering that there's a thin thin veil between reality and another. When you piece the veil, you're able to con make contact with these strange entities that are, to this day, not well understood. This is a secret teaching that has been passed down from the mystery schools of the initiatives, and the first technology these beings saw was gave, that gave us was fire. Fire was like capturing the sun with its warmth, safety, and power, and so we were able to tap into an alternate dimension, this other plane that we could only begin to receive their messages. So I have this experience, I've taken psychedelics, acid, mushrooms, and it is insane. It's otherworldly, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. I can't explain it to you with words. The shamanism is likely the oldest religion. The shaman's view of reality was comprised of five levels, the upper world or the heaven, the middle world or the earth, and the underworld or the lower world. The three world concept is not only spatial, it is a symbolic spirit, beings, deceased ancestors, and the gods dwell in the upper world. They offered wisdom and insight to the visiting shaman. The middle concerns of the earthly is comprised of only matter. The lower world consists of animalistic powers of the dead and who have not traveled to the higher world. In addition to the three-part cosmos, shamans see everything has life and not just humans and animals, but also stones, 
planets, stars. To them, everything has a soul which opens them up to the multi-dimensional world of connection. To the shaman, spirits are conscious, intelligent, and communicative beings who are roamed freely through different dimensional planes but are invisible to ordinary people. These ancient wise men became mediators between the spirits of nature or spirits of deceased on ancestors and the mundane world often special rituals were needed to facilitate the communication with these spirits they would dress with certain animal skins perform certain dances or sounds and they were known to also take psychedelics to enter into this altered state and you kind of realize that when you trip you can see all the energy and what it is you see plants are alive and moving and everything is that in our current age this is called mediumship it is believed to across many faiths that there was once a time where the gods were us but at some point they left with they were no longer here with society and they had to stop advancing but that is not the case our civilizations did not stop we have phones self-driving cars and we still have elite individuals at the top of our social hierarchies who in fact run the show how the brain uses 10% of its capacities with the basic senses, the supernatural senses like clairvoyance, psychic, can activate when we learn how. In doing so, we can become aware of angels residing in this region. The penile gland began to be the psychic center. The verbal mantra resonating the sound vibration stimulates specific areas of the brain that are responsible for the awareness of each of these three ethers and their angels. Rulers using scholars and scribes to have claimed made contact with the off-world entities from different planes of existence, offering amazing new technology that secure power and prestige. The Silicon Valley of the San Francisco Bay Area, a global hotspot for tech companies including Apple, Google, Facebook, and the very wealthy elite people that have taken their newest obsession, hallucinogenic drugs, DMT, LSD, and mushrooms, where they're able to, well, at least with DMT, they were able to make contact with elves, aliens, guides, helpers, and visually creative creatures resembling clowns, reptiles, praying mantises, spiders, bees, cacti, gnomes, and figures made from sticks, self-transforming machine elves. So I've taken a lot of acid and a lot of shrooms. I haven't really met any deities like exactly like they're saying. I tried DMT once, but I didn't break through, so I wasn't able to say anything, but everyone says they kind of see the same things when they do take DMT. The Sumerian tablets are very clear that their priests use medicines and incarnations to receive telepathic information from the beings that they believe to be divine. These machine elves through tripping gave information and technology to progress every civilization. And I wanna say as well, for all the top people and most of the tech companies, like Steve Jobs, he went to India, he was like kind of like monkish-like, his diet was only fruit, so he fought a lot of the things and he took a lot of acid and psychedelics and he was able to learn things from that. The Nazis also believed that they were in touch with the interdimensional beings who would give them engineering plans and technology. A whistleblower had information on, sev on secret contact programs of the government funds by the Rockefellers with the mission of turning everyone into soulless avatars or empty vessels for off-world entities to inhabit. These entities are waiting or wanting us to build as the result of the transhumanist agenda where man and machine unite monthly full moon meditations that they do. Countries are studying in secret UFO technology and trying to contact their civilizations, but downplayed in the news and media, there is not one Anunnaki movie notice with the little exception of Prometheus. Instead, people are stuffed with low grade fiction and fake occultism, which is in no way adds real awareness to truth. The entire known history of humankind is permeated by data on the existence of certain secret societies. Among people, basically anyone who is a certain evolutionary level either by intelligence, talent, or psychic awareness, gets recruited to become members of this secret association. According to some estimates, tech is 80 years behind and getting released to the public. The financial rationale for hiding the latest discoveries is obviously money is made on what is continuously bought. One of the companies producing electrical equipment bought and froze the patent for eternal bulbs invented at the end of the last century. Some reason Nikola Tesla's solid state converter, which converted energy penetrating space into electricity was taken out of circulation. A device the size of a soda can was tested for a week, providing completely free of charge electric power for a driving car. It is now logical to assume the knowledge of the science and technological achievements are hidden. It is possible that many of those who for a long time systematically withdrew and destroyed books and manuscripts with the secret knowledge have done so far to understand human considerations. This is why people go missing and books disappear because if everyone understood that there was like Nikola made like free energy, you don't need to use gasoline. You don't need to buy like and use all these things that keep us enslaved to our day to day jobs because we need to survive when these things are built. But then as soon as they're built, the elites will kill you or take it away. They say there is a whole list of scientific technical areas like remote viewing, 
physiological optics, transmutation of chemical elements at a single temperature, wireless transmission of energy at a distance, anti-gravity, space-time management, aspects of genetic engineering, and parapsychology. They want to recruit as many people as possible through their meditation groups. The elites are looking for psychically available people that can interface with other dimensions. These entitles are like some sort of weird parasite. They have a biological androids. Eventually, these are otherworldly beings who demand payment for their gifts of civilization. That payment would sometimes be the blood of people. This was certainly the case of the Mesopotamia after advancing to a certain degree. The likes of which the ancient world has not yet seen. This can be the scene of Babylonian, the Carthage, both of which sacrificed their children. It happened again and again with the Aztecs who became infamous for their mass killings and their sacrifice of their own people. Even in the case of the Nazis, it is clear how things ended. The death of millions of Jews. Many cultures have legends of portals and stargates that have to do with the alignment of the celestial bodies. A divine tunnel in the sky through which the soul achieves transcendence. Many priests and shamans got breathed in certain sites be performing rituals with gazing at the sky. Even at some of the wealthiest and most powerful individuals of our modern world involved similar activities as far as the war to Iraq. This part blew my mind. It had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction or even oil. The reason that it was going went after was supposedly the ancient secrets of technologies that the U.S. wanted to take over. There was a strange connection to this theory in the looting of the Iraq National Museum. When the war in Iraq began in 2003, Dr. Sala published a story telling that before the invasion of Iraq, the Bush administration learned of the ancient Stargate hidden in central Iraq. Evacuation sites, cities underneath the ground buried cities which i'm now starting to see on social media which if cities are buried we don't even know the real history of things burning of the museums and libraries deleting history he who controls the past controls the future art heist well fire can cover things up so imagine you see a museum being burned down imagine instead of all those things being deleted someone went in there stole all the tablets that had the secrets of the universe and then you covered it up with oh there was a fire so that is the Anunnaki Connection, dude. That was an amazing book. Hope you guys can take that and it can enhance your life and just know the history of things. Other than that, it's your boy. Have a good day and peace out.